Good evening, and welcome back, friends. Today, on Raven Investigates, we will be covering a case full of contradiction and cover-up. Today, we will look into a case of a life lost much too early, a young man that hid how he lived his weekends from his parents, and the decision to go to a party that led to a spiral of lies and confusion, covered finally in a layer of corruption and investigative failure. Today... We will be covering the unsolved murder of Kurt Sova. As stated, this case is about the murder of Kurt Eugene Sova. Kurt was, as described by his parents, Dorothy and Ken, a good kid that never got into trouble. He was the youngest of four sons and was very close to his parents. At the time of this event, Kurt was only 17 years old. This case starts on Friday, October 23rd, 1981. On that afternoon, Kurt left his house and met up with a friend a block away, and they made plans to spend some time at a duplex another two miles away. Unbeknownst to them, this would be a decision that would soon lead to the end of Kurt's life. By early Saturday morning, Kurt's parents had noticed that he never came home overnight. His mother started to call his friends, and his father started to comb the area looking for him and asking around if anyone had seen him. Their attempts to find him were fruitless, and on Sunday, they officially declared Kurt as a missing person with the Cleveland police. From here, his mother went on to place missing person flyers throughout the neighborhood in hopes that someone had seen her son. That day was when the first piece of important information came to be known. This was when she found out that Kurt had gone to a Halloween party at the aforementioned duplex. Dorothy went on the hunt to figure out what happened and decided to find the resident of said duplex, Susan. When she got there, she was met with another girl that was not Susan. She claimed to just be the babysitter, and that Susan was at work. Kurt's mother then told the babysitter to have Susan call her, and she did. But the initial information that she gave was not what she had expected. In the initial call, Susan told Dorothy that Kurt had not been to her place and that she never even had a party. Not willing to accept this answer, Dorothy went on the hunt and found out from the pizza delivery man, no less, that there was absolutely a party that last Friday. With this new information, she confronted Susan over the phone once again. This time, Susan changed her tune. There was a party. It was full of a bunch of people from nearby Detroit, a lot of which Susan didn't even know, and Kurt was there. On top of this, she learned from Susan and other guests that Kurt was seen drinking Everclear, something that a 17-year-old non-drinker of his stature, 5'11 and 136 pounds, shouldn't even be in the same room as. This information was an absolute shock to his family and friends. None of them knew him to be a drinker at all, much less one that would be able to tolerate any amount of Everclear. One of Kurt's friends confirmed the fact that he had been drinking at the party, as he told him that he helped Kurt, a very intoxicated Kurt, outside for some fresh air. The friend claimed to have left him hanging on a chain-link fence nearby. When he returned shortly thereafter, Kurt was gone. From here, it's a mystery what exactly took place. No one knows if he had stumbled onto the back roads of Ohio, or if he was abducted. Stepping back just a little bit, back to the flyers that the parents were handing out and hanging up, one of the stores where Kurt's parents hung up a flyer was a record store in the nearby town. After the flyer was hung up, the record store owner reported that an older man visited the store, looked at the flyer, and told the owner that the search was fruitless. He continued on to say, they might as well take it down because he's going to be found dead in two days and nobody is going to know how he died. On the following Monday, a classmate of Kurt's claimed to have seen Kurt alive on his way to a job interview. He claimed that Kurt was heading toward a van with people that were not from around the area. He claimed that Kurt also greeted someone in the van by the name of Franco. In addition to the previous information, 
Susan later called Kurt's parents and told them that Kurt had been sleeping on a cot in her basement. Kurt's father went to investigate and found that there was, in fact, a cot in the basement, but Kurt was not there, nor was anything that belonged to him. It wasn't until six days after Kurt had initially gone missing, October 28, 1981, that the next important piece of information would come to the surface. Unfortunately, this information would come in the report that three children had been exploring a nearby ravine and had found Kurt's body. This ravine was a mere 500 yards away from the duplex. When he was found, it should be noted that he was wearing a bright yellow t-shirt, one that stood out in the ravine, and was also found with no shoes on, his right shoe was never found, and his left shoe was found wedged in a rock formation nearby. The cause of Kurt's death could not be determined initially by coroners. His body had suffered no injuries, saving a few scrapes or bruises as the result of being barefoot, and nothing about the scene pointed to a clear indication as to how he had died. Later, the coroners had stated that he either died naturally or accidentally, a statement that is pretty much them giving up but saying they didn't think he was murdered, and it was also a statement not accepted by his family. The autopsy revealed that he had only been dead for 24 to 36 hours, though he had been missing for six days. And Ken also claimed that he had searched the area and not found him on Sunday when he went looking. Interestingly enough, Kurt wasn't the only person to have died on that street under mysterious and confusing circumstances. The first additional detail that I would like to throw in here is in relation to what I just said. Kurt was not the only young man found dead in a ravine on that street. 13-year-old Eugene Cavett was also found deceased in a ravine less than 2.5 miles from where Kurt's body was found and only around three months later. To add to this, Eugene actually knew Kurt and the two were acquainted. In both cases, the victim was found in the ravine and missing their right shoe. However, in contrast to Kurt's case, Eugene was determined to have died by falling, either accidentally or on purpose, into said ravine. A report written by Bill Salmon of The Plain Dealer in 1991 stated quite a bit of more information on this situation. First off, and this part may sound strange, but apparently when Kurt's body was found, he was found in cruciform. That means arms out, one leg straight and the other bent with his foot over his leg, and his head turned to the side, almost as if he was posed before he was found. On top of this, most of the police involved in the investigation for Kurt's death have been brought down for charges, all the way from falsifying credentials to trafficking drugs. Apparently, the lead detective, Robert Karras, was exposed as a drug addict and had a record of attacking and stomping handcuffed prisoners. In 1991, he was sentenced to up to 15 years in prison for his acts. Apparently, Karras really messed up this investigation. He failed to take photographs of Kurt's body when it was found, no search of the duplex was ever performed, and no written statements ever conducted by those who last saw Kurt alive. In addition to this, the same article in The Plain Dealer took statements from Kurt's friends, who stated that Kurt was known to drink and party on the weekends, in complete contrast to what his parents had initially reported. This went as far to say that apparently on that Friday, Kurt had actually skipped school and gone to a nearby liquor store, where he convinced an adult going into the store to buy him a bottle of, you guessed it, Everclear. From there, he supposedly spent the day drinking at his girlfriend's house, and then went to a party with his friends and continued drinking. Another point to add, apparently after everything had gone down, the Sova family had visited that duplex more than they initially reported. So much so, and to the extent, that they had to file a police report and the Sova family was no longer allowed to make contact with the people living in the duplex. Also, apparently, 
Ken's visit to the duplex about the cot was not a friendly one. He had gotten aggressive and literally kicked in the door to search the house in the basement. This was also the same day that Kurt's body was found in the nearby ravine. This may not mean anything or really add much to the case here, but it is important to look at how the family responds to the information they're given, as this information could easily cause problems with the investigations. That said, the investigation, I wouldn't say it was a good one at all. When the coroner had done Kurt's autopsy, it was found that Kurt had a blood alcohol level of 0.11%, which is above Ohio's legal definition of being drunk, but far less than the amount that would be considered fatal. Drug tests also came back negative, and from this, the coroner had no choice but to label the death as a probable accident. Probably the strangest part of this whole case is the homeless man that predicted they would find Kurt's body two days later and they wouldn't know what had killed him. Apparently, this man actually came back to the record store. He actually bought the record store owner a bouquet of flowers with a poem. Roses are red, the sky is blue, they found him dead, and they'll find you too. When the man came back to the store a third time, the cops were called, and they labeled him simply as some wacko from Detroit. And then they just let him go. No statement from that man was ever taken. No information about him was ever jotted down. Nothing. One last bit of information to add in here. There was a report made unofficially by a woman that said that she saw two men dragging an unconscious teenage boy through an alleyway just before Halloween, and they were headed in the direction of the ravine where Kurt was later found. She had told this information, unfortunately years later, to Kenneth Sova, who then reported it to the police. But, again, nothing ever came of it. No interviews, and no follow-up. All of this information makes the next section of this video one that is incredibly difficult to fill out. But, that said, let's move on to the possible suspects. This is a huge list of unknowns, to be frank. Let's start with the least likely situation. Kurt may have fallen into the ravine and died from said fall. If the coroner was absolutely incompetent, I would say that this would be possible, but from what I could tell, the coroner may have been the only person in this investigation that actually knew what he was doing. That is to say, of course, that he wasn't working with an officer that told him to report it as an unknown cause of death. Another one that most people wouldn't consider, an officer, or possibly even the detective in charge of the case, Robert Karras. While I understand that Karras was put on the case after the fact, it's just strange to me that he botched this investigation so bad. Yes, he was later found to be a major drug addict, and yes, he was a terrible police officer, but I don't think that would lead directly to destroying the case like he did. It almost felt intentional. On top of that, one of the cases that Karras was charged on, he had apparently physically assaulted a man that was driving drunk. He pulled the guy over, and when the guy started to get an attitude, he apparently hit him with his flashlight several times in the face. He later went to the hospital, where this guy was being treated, checked him out, put him in the squad car, and drove him to a warehouse next to where Kurt's body was found, and then attempted to assault this man a second time. While it's not likely that he had anything to do with Kurt's death, it is possible that he had something to do with a cover-up. He was a violent man, he had committed his violent acts in the area near where Kurt was found, and he absolutely destroyed this investigation. Aside from these, we have Franco, who was never found or identified by the police, the homeless man slash wacko from Detroit, who threatened the record store owner and knew exactly when they would find the body, and hasn't been seen since the initial investigation, someone at the party, but 
This would only work if, as stated above, the coroner failed miserably and Kurt had been dead for several more days than they had claimed, or the person had kidnapped him and held him for several days. Lastly, there's the possibility that Kurt just died while with a bunch of friends, and they didn't know what to do. Maybe he had willingly gone with a group of people he knew and wanted to party with them. It's possible he died while with them, and their solution was to dump the body in the ravine. They knew where the ravine was because of the prior party and didn't want to get the police involved because they thought they would get in trouble. Or maybe one of the people involved in his death was related to or connected to the police. Hence the absolutely botched investigation and failure on the detective's part. Disclaimer! This is my opinion. Solely my opinion. My opinion only. It is not your opinion. It is not necessarily a popular opinion or unpopular opinion. It is solely and simply the opinion of me, as the Raven dreams. Okay, that out of the way. As I said, this case is filled with maybes and other pure points of speculation. There are so many moving parts and so many unknown variables that it would be impossible to actually come to some conclusion that I feel comfortable with saying I am confident this happened. But if I were to point to what I think is the most likely possibility out of the entire list of possibilities, I would say my last statement in the prior section would be it. Based on what I've read, it seems like maybe Kurt wasn't the perfect kid his parents thought he was. It seemed he had a propensity to go out and party with friends, including both drugs and very hard alcohol. Being a kid, at 17, he probably hung out with a group of guys that weren't much older than him. The party on Friday was apparently a group of people that were all from Detroit, and this was a group that Kurt didn't know. Maybe they had something harder than he was personally used to, and maybe they wanted to pull Kurt into their group, took him from outside the house where he was found, and to wherever it was they were hanging out. From there, maybe he died from... something. Maybe natural or unnatural, and they freaked out. So they took him back to the duplex, and dumped him in the ravine. Now, there are a few parts of the story that do contradict my thoughts. The friend claimed they saw him alive, and getting in a van with Franco the following Monday. This is a weird situation because if he was in town on Monday and getting into a van with some friends, why hadn't he gone home yet? By this point, he had already been reported as missing and there were already flyers up, so you think he would at least check in with his parents to say, hey, I'm alive and everything's fine. The homeless man also knew when they would find the body, though maybe that was just a crazy man saying weird things that happened to be right. Also. There's the position the body was found in, like it was posed. I don't really have a comment on that one. And then the police botched this investigation, though again, maybe that was just really bad police work. The unfortunate truth is that we may never have answers in this case. Kurt's murder happened 39 years ago as of October this year. The investigative body that was looking into it has been essentially disbanded due to their own crimes. Both of Kurt's parents passed away without ever knowing what caused their son's death, Kenneth in 2001 and Dorothy in 2014. In addition to that, two of his brothers have also passed away, and his third brother Kevin is still looking for answers. It's not all lost when it comes to this case, however. As of last year, November to be exact, the Newburgh Heights Police Department was partnering with Tiffin University to reopen the case. Also, as of February of this year, the crime con event known as Crowd Solve featured Kurt's case. In this event, over a hundred participants worked together to examine the case in full and try to help solve it. As this was only a few months ago, there hasn't been much released in ways of results, but with that many people looking over it, there's definitely a chance that they could find more information, even a single clue, that could point law enforcement in the right direction. So, 
Maybe a year from now I'll be able to release an update to this video with information that Kurt's case was solved. That's obviously best case scenario, and I hope that is the case. That all said, what do you guys think of this? Do you think he died and was placed in the ravine? If so, was it malicious, or was it a group of guys that just freaked out? Do you think the police were involved? And do you think the partygoers had anything to do with it? Please do let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear your theories and thoughts. If I said anything that was incorrect, please correct me. I will issue correction videos as needed. With all that said and done, my friends, I will see you on the next Raven Investigates. But until that day, this is Raven, signing off. Sleep well.